Welcome back to Mayo Clinic Radio. I'm Dr. Tom Shives. And I'm Tracy McRae. Tracy, Autism Spectrum Disorder, or ASD, it refers to several developmental disorders that impair a child's ability to communicate and to, to interact with others. Now, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention now estimates that one out of every 68 children has autism spectrum disorder. And it doesn't seem to you like this is a condition that's much more common than it used to be? That's what I thought. We're going to find out more today. We'll talk to the experts. Yes, autism spectrum disorder now includes disorders that were previously considered separate. Autism, Asperger's syndrome, uh, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, we got a lot of things in this yeah, category. That's right. Here to discuss autism spectrum disorder is Mayo Clinic psychologist, Dr. Andrea Hebner. Welcome to the program, Dr. Hebner. Thank you. Good to be here. Hi, Dr. Hebner. Great to have you on the program. So I, I realize that they have now lumped some uh, uh, several conditions together under the term autism or autism spectrum disorder, but it just doesn't seem to me like when I was growing up that I heard much about this condition at all. And now you hear about it all the time. And the CDC says one out of every 68 children has some ASD or autism spectrum disorder. Is it more common than it used to be? We don't think that autism spectrum disorder is actually more common than it used to be. The change has really come in different ways that we're now diagnosing. So it used to be back in the 40s and 50s when autism was first identified that we were really only talking about children who were very impaired, usually children who had significant deficits both in their social um, skills and communication abilities, um, but also usually were intellectually disabled, so they functioned in the impaired range from an intellectual standpoint. That has really changed in the last 10 to 15 years so that um, professionals are now diagnosing children who have much milder presentations of autism spectrum disorder. So now we're including in the spectrum children who are verbal and children who have normal intellectual ability, but they still have impairment related to some milder symptoms. And those would be more socially noticeable than, uh, than before? Well, before, these children were quite obvious. Mm -hmm. They were the children maybe who weren't speaking or were speaking very little. They might have some very unusual behaviors like rocking or hand flapping that really made them look obviously different than typical children. But now we're starting to notice that children who have much milder presentations, so they're verbal, but they have trouble with perhaps the give and take of conversation. They have trouble recognizing um, the meaning of eye contact or different facial expressions. So these are kids who might be going a little too far with silliness and humor, uh, might be a bit annoying to other children, but they don't pick up on it. They might not know that different behavior is expected when you're in the library versus the grocery store versus when you're just at home with your family. So we're just getting better at diagnosing the situation or the condition. Right. We're, we are, we are di identifying children who have more subtle difficulties um, but are still impaired related to those difficulties. And this can really be a fine line, and we struggle with this because, of course, we don't want to over-diagnose children and, and apply a label that is not appropriate for them. Um, but there are many children who have these more subtle conditions that are now being diagnosed, whereas they weren't before. And I would assume that the milder conditions are in general diagnosed at a later time uh, when the children are older as opposed to the more severe form? Absolutely. So the classic form of autism we now can diagnose as young, reliably about two years of age. So these are kids who are still being diagnosed as toddlers and preschoolers. But these more subtle um, presentations of autism sometimes, especially since children tend to have normal intellect with that presentation, they can be six, seven, even nine or ten years old. That's not common, but it does happen. How is it diagnosed? How do you diagnose these different things along the spectrum? So the standard of care for autism diagnosis is a multidisciplinary evaluation. So here at Mayo Clinic, we have a wonderful team of lots of different professionals who come together to make these diagnoses. So we have psychologists and neuropsychologists like myself who are part of the team. Um, we also have a child psychiatrist. We have developmental behavioral pediatricians, occupational therapists, speech language therapists. Um, we often involve our colleagues from neurology and genetics to help weigh in on, in on these cases. 
We also use the support of our social workers and nursing staff. So what we do is we see these children in a week-long evaluation, and they come in and they meet with lots of different people, whoever is necessary given their particular concerns. And then at the end of the week, we come together in a team meeting. We discuss all the kids who have come through clinic. And then after that, we meet with the parents and talk about any diagnosis and treatment recommendations. So it really is a group effort. This must be difficult for the parents when you sit down and talk with them about their child and the diagnosis. It is difficult. These are difficult meetings, and we've talked as a team about how we can help parents and families get through this process um, and how we can support them on this journey. Um, so we have modified over time the way that we give results, the length of time of our appointments. We find that you know, often getting a first-time diagnosis of autism is very difficult news, and so parents aren't able to process a lot of information at that initial meeting, so we tend to make those brief. Um, but then we have our nurse follow up with the family about six weeks after diagnosis, and then we see them at regular three-month intervals after that in the first six to nine months or so just to make sure that they are getting the support they need and that their child is enrolled in the appropriate treatments. How do you treat someone when you said the proper treatment? How do you determine what that is? How do you go about that? That's a really difficult question, and it's based on the child's presentation. So, for example, a child who has what we would consider classic autism, where they have significant deficits in, in all three areas, including language and communication, as well as social skills and restricted and repetitive behaviors, those children are usually good candidates for something called applied behavior analysis, or ABA therapy. Um, so that's the standard of care for children who have that particular presentation. For older children who have milder presentations, we might recommend social skills groups. We might recommend accommodations through school, uh, different outside therapies, sometimes medication, although not often. Um, medication can be used to treat some of the symptoms that these children have, but it, it doesn't take away autism. Um, but it really is a myriad of different treatments, and each child is different. I've heard anecdotal evidence about diet even, some uh, that are on the milder end of the spectrum, that even changes in diet can make a change. Have you heard anything on that, or do you help parents with that? Parents often have that question. So in autism, I suppose, as in, in other areas of medicine as well, there are what are considered kind of the core standard treatments, but then there are also what might be considered more experimental treatments. Um, diet is something that people often ask about because it's within parents' control, sure. and parents at this stage are often really eager to find anything that will help. Anecdotally, uh, p parents will say that a diet change, like a gluten-free, casein-free diet, or omitting certain dyes from a diet is helpful for their child. But when we look at the group evidence, there is really no evidence to suggest that those things make a significant difference for children on the spectrum. Okay, save the most difficult question for last. What causes this, and is there any evidence uh, that childhood vaccinations have anything to do with the <laughs> development of autism? So the cause of autism is unknown. We know that there's something genetic that's going on with these children, but we also know that there's an environmental component as well that we do not fully understand. Because the, the range and spectrum of autism is so broad, there are many candidate genes that have been implicated. So if we look at the genetic markers for these children, they vary considerably. There are a few that um, tend to be more pronounced um, that we see more often, but there's something like 700 candidate genes where we see differences in children with autism. So wow. we really have a long way to go in terms of understanding the genetic basis. We also know, though, that there's something environmental because when we do twin studies of monozygotic twins who have the same DNA, um, it's not uncommon to have one twin with autism and the other one to not be affected. So we know that there's something else environmental, and there have been lots of um, theories put forth about what that could be, maternal illness during pregnancy, age of parents, something environmental that's kind of unknown, but we don't have the answer to that question just yet. You know, hopefully someday you'll figure it out because there are a lot of people who, who would like to get the answer to that question. And thanks so much for filling us in and uh, about autism spectrum disorder. You've been most helpful. Psychologist Dr. Andrea Hebner, thanks very much. Thank you.